We left Long Island in mid-June 2006 and after a brief stopover at Block, we crossed the Atlantic to the Azores. We cruised for two weeks, stopped in Madeira for a day or two and then went to the Canaries for two weeks. We moved down to the uh, Cape Verdes, crossed the equator on the way to Brazil. We stopped at about a dozen ports and anchorages in Brazil, made a brief excursion to the Abrojos Reef for some snorkeling worked our way down the coast to the River Plate. In Uruguay we had a complete crew change and I flew home for a couple of weeks. We stopped in Argentina and then made a shot to the Falkland Islands. We then crossed over to the South Shetlands, worked our way through the Antarctic Peninsula to the Antarctic Circle, made a shot back to Chile, stopped at Robinson Crusoe Island and then refueled in Ecuador on the way to the Panama Canal. From there we sailed through the Windward Passage to the Bahamas, across to Bermuda and arrived home in mid-May 2007 with about 20,000 miles under the keel. This is Bon Voyage, June 3rd for the trip to the Antarctic. See, you can get the dog to look interested. <laughs> the rain brought a soggy end to the party and the rising water caused us to abandon ship. As we leave Weeks Yard on board are Peggy, Dan and Mickey. I should mention that uh, for this trip we were repeating the cruise we made in 98-99 and I wanted to see what changes occurred in Antarctica due to global warming. Also on the trip in 2005 I planned to make Antarctica but failed because of minor injuries and lack of time. This time, I was going to make it. There's Southeast White. Block Island was our last glimpse of the USA for a year. As we pushed into the Atlantic, we ran into some heavy weather for a few days. Not much wind today. We're at 41 north, 53 west, halfway to the Azores. Ah, good shot there. We ran into a pod of pilot whales. And there's Dan on the bow trying to get a picture. Good running conditions, about 400 miles from Flores. Can you see the speed there? Eight knots. <laughs> Mickey is rigging the burgee of the South Bay Cruising Club. Here we are at the uh, famous Porta Wall, and here we have our skipper, Eric Forsyth, who's touching up his sign, Fiona's sign, which has been here for many years. Dan left us in the Azores and Louise joined the boat. Here is the moon rising over Pico, viewed from the marina at Horta, and this is a shot of the marina itself on the island of Fayel. Here's the caldera of Fayal. These are the uh, hydrangea bushes that divide the fields in Fayal. Just miles of them. This is the lighthouse at Capolino that was destroyed by the volcanic eruption in 57 58. And this is all the volcanic ash left over. On our cruise through the Azores, we uh, anchored in 
St George, and here it is. From there we sailed to Gracioso to look at the active volcano and the sulphur cavern. Louise has just come down this medieval looking tower. It brings you right into the crater here. Yeah. Here's a, a mud hole bubbling sulphur or gas of some kind that smells of sulphur. We're at a marina on the island of Tessera. This is Angra de Heroism, it's called, on a Sunday afternoon. The shot of the British uh, anti-aircraft guns protecting the airfield they built at Tessera in the war, World War II. We're about 600 feet up here. In Madeira, the locals scare the wits out of the tourists by pushing them down a steep hill in a wicker sled. We're standing on the tallest cliff in Europe, I believe, here. Something like 800 meters straight down. This is Porto Manitz on the north coast, and uh, they've established a lot of uh, so-called natural swimming pools here, which seem to be very popular. This is a, a really spectacular valley in the centre of Madeira. Remains of some of the terraced horticulture that you see here, there, down here. There. All the way down, this village has <coughs> prospered off the, uh, the stuff they grow on the side of these steep mountains. You can see how small the terraces are in places. And this is the little yacht harbour here at Lagamora. There's a, a couple of quaint English boats here. character type of uh, skipper, He's lived here six years, never moves it of course. Louise decided to feed the mullets that infest the harbours of the Canaries. Can I'll take a close of her, I can see it. There's the cow and the cock there somewhere. A Lagomera t shirt. Isn't that like oh, wow. You don't see many of those. Wait. About 150 miles from the Cape Verde. And last night the, uh, the mainsail tore along a seam. Seam let go, we're running. With 25 knot winds, but double reefed. So, what we're going to do now is change the mainsail. There's the faithful Victor steering the boat while we perform all this with the boat just uh, idling along under the jib. Louise left the boat in the Canaries and Marco joined us. There we are. What we're going to do now is tie it to this lifeline here. Here's our stone mainsail bent on. Marco's just putting the vang on. This is our arrival at uh, San Vicente Island in the uh, Cape Verde group. Rather rough arrival, the wind has accelerated to 25 to 30. Oh no! It looks like Father Neptune. Yeah, 
Here we are at Elders Bar, our favourite watering hole on Fernando de Naranha, which was a Brazilian penal colony for centuries before it became a tourist trap. Uh, the great phallic symbol. This is the uh, rough stone path built by the convicts, probably more than 100 years ago, on Fernando de Naranha, and it leads up to the fort. Here's the fort, the main entrance. Here we are overlooking St. Anthony's Bay, Fernando de Naranha. We are back in Jacare, and they're still playing Ravel's Bolero at sunset. This is the train that runs past Jacare to Joe Pessoa. And it's now pulling up to the station at uh, Jacare. Mickey and Marco left us here and were joined by Andre and Mike, who you see here catching the train to Joe Pessoa. Looks like the surplus uh, New York subway trains. <laughs> this is some kind of political rally. There's an election pending and we arrived in Joe Pessoa at the same time as the Brazilian president, Lula. And here he is. Here's the historic square in the center of Salvador. At night, the place is alive with terrific Brazilian music. Grande, we've been here before, of course. In fact, only about 18 months ago. And we came north with Ruth and Sasha. Okay, this is a scene early in the morning at the Abrea waterfront. Uh, here's the crew coming ashore. Chasing all the girls, wherever they are. Some of the local ladies. This is the busy scene on the jetty at Parati. Uh, people going out for day charters. Here's a big charter vault. And this is what the place looks like. This is what medieval Brazil looked like. There's the cathedral just showing up. This is the uh, the river that flows through Parati. Just the cold streets. There's a guy loading bricks off a donkey cart. We're back in Santos. Here we are, entering the Santos River here. Starboard side is the famous fort that Francis Drake attacked. Must have been almost 500 years ago, maybe 450. Big working armourers, fishing boats, freighters coming up. 
right to there. This is the beach scene at Santos uh, the day we arrived. That's the river there. And uh, here's the guy selling coconuts. <laughs> I guess when he chops his fingers off, he loses his job. Santos, it's been raining for three days. This is the November 15th plaza in Florianopolis, and uh, this here is a 150 year old fig tree. How about that? I'm afraid it needs support, like most things that are 150 years old. A little gale that developed this morning off uh, the south end of the Brazilian coast, and Mike is going to take a shot on deck. This heavy weather was a reminder that we'd left the temperate waters of the tropics and we're heading for the southern ocean. Ponta del Este. And the giant hand is slowly disappearing in the sand. That's all that's left of it. Here are the sea lions of Ponte del Este. What do you say, kid? Yeah, have a good scratch. This is the barbecue at Alberto's place yeah. here. There's Alberto working away. There's <laughs> <coughs> Paul and here. Gaston. Alberto. That's uh, Ware, and there's Joey, and this is Alberto's weekend place in the middle of Punta del Este. In Mar del Plata, Argentina, we bent on heavy weather sails for the trip to Antarctica. I'm going to fold it. Yeah, it's nearly folded. There goes Joy, carrying our sail, all bagged up. More heavy weather on the way to the Falkland Islands. Oh no, it's a steady 30, you know, for the rocket and the boat. Merry Christmas from the Falklands, 2006. see that Father Christmas has been here. Yeah. At Port Stanley, we rigged the boat for our conditions further south. We bent on the 65-pound uh, fisherman's anchor and mounted a, a reel carrying extra uh, rope and chain for a stern line. This is the Boxing Day racing at Stanley <laughs> in the Falkland Islands. The race has begun, I think, down there. I think they won. <laughs> Somebody won. This is a plot of our route in Antarctica and the South Shetlands. We stopped first at Nelson and then went to King George. We visited Greenwich and Deception, sailed down the Bransfield Strait to Port Lockroy on Wayanke Island there, and then through the Le Maire Channel, the Grand Didier Channel. At the south end, we ran into floating ice. Uh, Fiona is, after all, fiberglass. We backtracked around the Renault Islands and then sailed to the Antarctic Circle at 6633 South. We are heading across the Southern Ocean for the South Shetland Islands and Antarctica. Arrival in Antarctica, Nelson Island over there. Carrying a little jib, but we've got the engine running too. And there's the ice in the cockpit. And on the binnacle. 
guys are gonna get the anchor ready. We've been plastered by snow. Joe hadn't seen ice before. These fairly large pieces of ice are breaking off that uh, that uh, glacier there. And unfortunately, you can see from the size of some of these things, we don't want it to bump into us. So I think we picked it, of course, just based on the chart. And uh, I think it's time we just moved a bit to where there's less ice. Right the name of this guy here. We are beating down the Bransfield Strait to Greenwich Island. Greenwich Island. There she is. Fiona is anchored in Yankee Harbor, Greenwich Island. A fantastic backdrop. Enormous wall of ice. Must be 60, 80 feet high. Greenwich Island is quite famous for its penguin colonies. But the penguins are totally ignored by this elephant seal pup. Trepid Joey is uh, trying to commune with the uh, guys in there being fed. We're preparing to go ashore at Whalers Bay, Deception Island, the last of the South Shetlands. Yep. Okay. The old whaling base here at uh, Deception Island. There's Fiona, way out there. They built this hut here and went to trouble squaring off the foundations there. Pretty amazing that they went to that much trouble. But they lived crudely. We'll have a look inside. There's a couple of bunks there. A few shelves. And there's the stove. A big picture window. <laughs> Don't know what they needed that for. Aircraft hangar at uh, Whalers Bay, Deception Island, and when I was here in '99, it was full of snow. This is all the detritus of the whaling operation. This is the generator room of the old base at Whalers Bay, Deception Island. Two generators here. There's usually two, so they can service one. And there's the old meter panel with defective meters, there's no needles in any of them. There's a crankshaft on the table. Deception Island, uh, Whalers Bay, still volcanic, they have eruptions down again and here you can see the steam coming from the water's edge. So some kind of underground effluent <laughs> mixing there with the seawater. Penguin taking his morning steam bath here at Whalers Bay, Deception Island. Go on, go into the sea and get your bath. That's it. This is uh, running downwind the Bransfield Strait. Jib out. And it's snowing, you can see. Got the deck covered with some sleety snow. Tilly working away there. It's foggy and the radar's gone out. Terrific. In the Gerlach Strait, heading for the uh, Newmeyer Channel. Which is down there. And over on our left here. The Antarctic Peninsula. We're just sailing under a reef mainsail. 
And the funny thing is that back there with the first reef is full of ice, the water got frozen that was in the big lumps of ice at the bottom. <laughs> this is Fiona selling down the Gerlach Strait. What is it, the 9th? January 9th. Uh, Fort Lockroy is about 20 miles away. And there's the Antarctic. So, one or two icebergs around. One over there, one down here. That's some big ones. That's big ones earlier on. Most of them are around in shallow water. So, not quite as blowy as when I was in the Gerlach Strait last, I don't think. It's quite a nice day, but cold. Snow on deck here. But we're sailing very nicely. Now the New Maya Channel, which leads to Port Lock Roy. It's impossible to capture the grandeur of the scenery. Look at that spectacular cliff. The bay where Fiona is anchored was frozen solid in 99, so that's a change. There's the base over there on that Goodyear Island. Hello, birdie. What do you have to say for yourself? I'm going down. It's pretty smelly, this place. And there's the whale skeleton. In 99, this same island was covered with snow. You can see us following the penguins there. This Uruguayan frigate is apparently looking after the greatly increased number of cruise ships. Uh, we're now approaching the entrance to the famous Le Maire Channel, just south of 65 South. It looks pretty iced up. You can never tell. Fair number of bergs around. We've got a modest one here on our left there. Uh, we've got a spotter. Joe is spotting the way. Where is uh, steering? And Paul is on the lookout on the bow. There's a modest sized berg on our port side. And we just saw a big piece of snow and ice fall off one of these mountains into the sea and cause quite a, an explosion. It looks a bit like a depth charge going off, actually. But all those things look fairly small. Even the small ones could weigh a ton or two and we don't want to hit it. We have a lovely afternoon though, it's, it's quite warm. No wind though. We did have a wind earlier, but now it's died. I would go left to touch if I were you. Just go left, hard left, go hard left. And then, and then come hard right, see through this little channel here. Yeah, yeah, Paul's got it. Joe is really getting carried away by the spotting for ice. Well, for passages, leads, as they're called. Almost into the Le Maire now, just about a mile formally into the passage. We are halfway down the Le Maire channel here, and uh, a good wind has come up. Uh, on the nose, of course, I guess it's funneling through the passage.
We're coming to the end of the Le Maire Channel, but poised above us are some very unstable looking snow and ice. <laughs> Looks like it may drop on us any time. This is the Ukrainian base on Galinda's Island. We found a nice little anchorage with 40 feet of water. These are the people from the uh, Ukrainian base, which is over here. And they just visited and they've taken away our jerry jugs. So we're hoping to get some diesel off them. And there's a bird that just crept on the dinghy, whatever you are. Where is unfastening a stern line that we rigged to keep the boat centred in a small cove near the Ukrainian base. Nice iceberg on the way to the uh, Antarctic Circle here, which we're beating to against the headwind, ironically. It looks like for a while that's the last berg in our way for a while. Southward, ever southward, we at uh, this point had backtracked to come around the Renault Islands to avoid the ice and we're in the open sea heading for the Antarctic Circle which we crossed uh, in the dark actually in half a gale. Here the GPS shows that it was early in the morning, the time there is Greenwich time so it's about 5 o'clock in the morning when we crossed 66.33 at around about 69 west. From there on we headed for Chile. In the Drake Passage we had unusually good weather, a high pressure system had settled in and here you see the painted petrels that fluttered in our wake, I think eating nourishment that we disturbed by our wake, a very uh, interesting bird. Seas that are running here, 61 to 50 sides, the weather did deteriorate a little bit heading up towards Chile but with no real gales the whole way up. And of course, as we got further north, we were joined by the great wandering albatross. We're uh, taking the plates off the big cabin windows here now that we're north of 50 South. Which constitutes a westward rounding of Cape Horn. Forward upper. Okay, here comes the plate. We've got six all together, but this is the fourth. Okay, today. Yeah. The plate's ready to go back in storage. Joe is up the mast again, weaving a new halyard. Now he has to transfer to the starboard side and come down the wetlands. This is Chilaweo, the Peninsula Lacui it's called. And we're heading for that uh, cape over there. Punta uh, Guapacho, where there's the uh, Corona Lighthouse, Faro Corona. It's the 31st of uh, January. Here's a show laid on by the local dolphins in the Chiqueo Canal as we head for Porto Mont. Here's the uh, perfect volcano of Osorno that uh, overlooks Porto Mont, which is on our left there. We're just coming up uh, the Bay of Ron Calvani, I think it's pronounced, under power, not much wind. This is our last happy hour together on this leg, and uh, it's our last happy hour. On this lake together, we're approaching Porto Mont. I'll switch the camera around in a minute. We've got a 
Ordo's here, go ahead, pick your out there. He's got mussels, he's got three nut peanut butter. Mussels, and I'm gonna have mussels. And our toast is uh, Porto Mon, thank God we finally found it, right? <laughs> Cheers. Here's an archival shot of Tilly, uh, an autopilot that we rigged to take the place of Victor the Vane when the wind is very light and it operates the Ares gear. Works very well. And it's Mickey's birthday. Happy birthday, Mickey. Yeah, he's 39. <laughs> On one foot. <laughs> so, get singing, where? Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. To you. Happy birthday, dear Mickey. Happy birthday to you. Ah, right. bravo. Okay. And that's a rum raisin carrot cake. Ah, if we only get that wind outside, we'd be doing great. Uh, this is Fiona anchored in Cumberland Bay, Robinson Crusoe Island, which is part of the Juan Fernandez uh, archipelago. The other island is called uh, Alexander Selkirk, after the original inspiration for Robinson Crusoe. And this is the little village here. Just spent the morning there. And we're going to climb up that valley there and up to this saddle there, I believe. Here is a view of Cumberland Bay and part of the island from the lookout a point that allegedly Alexander Selkirk climbed to every day to watch for a ship to rescue him when he was marooned in the 18th century. Uh, a somewhat fanciful depiction of Robinson Crusoe. This is Robinson Crusoe Island in the Juan Fernandez group. And the port captain's office is right there where the flag is. And this was a, a wild prison island and the, uh, the prisoners lived in caves, which you can just see there. And Mickey is about to incarcerate himself in one of the caves. You can see that while well, they've got a nice park, the streets are not paved. And pretty muddy. It's very sticky mud. This is from inside the yacht club here at Robinson Crusoe Island. And just anchored 200 yards away, it's Fiona. And we're going to have lunch, and they've laid a rather nice lunch table for us. And all you eat here is local fish, there's, there's no meat at all. And there's the bar. We're looking down one of the main streets, there are only two T-shaped main streets in Robinson Crusoe Island. And dotted down the main street are several of these things, guns off the German battleship, the Dresden. That was sunk by the British in World War One. Okay, we're stuck here in the uh, intertropical convergence zone. You can see that there's really nothing going on. And where is going to take a swim? Ah, oh, you can take a swim if you like. There, clever. Oh. Are you? Yeah. Wow, hold on. Wow. <laughs> I can see the grey white whale! There he sits, seems to be Father Neptune with his recycled uh, crap. Him. <laughs> <laughs> oh! I've come for this polywog! Be, wary. Be, wary. be very wary. Last night. They tell me it's indeed so. And also a few weeks ago you crossed the Antarctic Circle. You can believe it. Amazing, amazing. I think you're the most qualified uh, polywog we ever had, right? Wow. It seems to be. What an honor. Yeah. So, there you are. You can read that. Unfortunately, it's switched a bit. Oh. It's official. Seven. We crossed on Fiona, the equator. 
and we've had no wind for days. I think yesterday we managed to sail for a few hours against a headwind. Otherwise, it's been flat calm. We got the main up, but we're just generating the wind ourselves, really. The fuel will run out tomorrow, but we'll save 15 gallons for the last few miles into Panama, so we need a bit of wind. But 100 miles of sailing and we'll make it. We'll see. Well, this is uh, Panama. We waited to go through the canal. That's the Pan American Highway bridge there. But we found when we're sailing up in the uh, Gulf of Panama that we'd torn the jib. Here's the patch. So we're just gluing the patch on and then later on today we'll stitch it. Come on, Fury. And we got the salad blender going. We're in the old town of Panama, the old section. Here's the cathedral, which we just went into. Oh, I can smell the Atlantic. There it is, the Atlantic we are aiming for. Okay, one, two, Dude, come on down. Just another couple of thousand miles and we're home for the winter. Summer? We've got our mola sales here from Kuna Indians and the San Blas. These ones are good war, but it's on many color. So this more a little bit more expensive money. So nice, some quality mola. So on to people like it for house, for family. So mm -hmm. people like it, cheaper one for present. It's other one. It's some mola, some same, some same design, some same war. And how much is that one? This one is two fifty. Oh, for two, for two, for two, two yeah. Two panel, two fifty. Mm, so, so different, <laughs> so different. We're still beating our way towards the windward passage, but the wind has come up 20 to 25, so it's a tough beat. But we could do with more favourable winds, that's for sure. I'm 39 years old and I don't look a day over it, do I? <laughs> <laughs> so, there's a Fiona cake. Which I which he insisted on. I insisted on it, that's right. And he said, you know, this is the only time that he'll be editing his own footage of him. My own so, birthday party. All right, happy birthday to you. Thank happy you. Happy birthday, dear Lewis. Happy birthday to you. Blow the candles out. <laughs> ah. <laughs> okay. The voice through the windward passage and the beat to get there dislodged the masthead light. And here I am removing it. Fortunately, it's very calm here in the Bahamas. And Mickey has put the new light that Lou brought with him when he came over from Florida. And he's pulling it up so I can install it at the masthead. Standing in the cockpit of Fiona is Brenda, who's come over from Florida for the weekend. Okay, Bren, you can climb off the boat. Do you want me to take your bag? No, it's okay. It means you're getting off. On the ferry to Elbow Key. Hope Town on Elbow Key. 
in the Bahamas. We just had a nice lunch here. And Brenda is going to feed a fish. And there's the great shot of the famous lighthouse. Here I am single-handing to Bermuda from the Bahamas. For various reasons, Mickey, Lou and Ware all left the boat. I say, this is me, master of my own ship. All crew to cook for. For lunch, I'm having uh, egg salad with Spam. I do love a bit of Spam, as Gromit would say. No, it's Wallace. It's Wallace that says that, sorry. I do love a bit of Spam, as Wallace would say. Do he like cheese? Because I like cheese too. The sunrise is coming to St George's Bermuda. We're tied up here at the customs dock that we got here last night in the dark. And fortunately we're able to spend the night here. In the meanwhile, <coughs> the early morning light looks very pleasant here. With the palm trees silhouetted and the casuarinas. It's a Bermuda pomp and circumstance here. There's the governor. And here's Stuart, who has come to saw the pulpit right off. The pulpit got damaged when we offloaded crew at a broken down dock in the Exumas, and it has to be replaced. Try picking it up, Stuart. I like the idea of you actually standing on the pulpit while you saw it. No, we're only lifting the top part. Okay. Oh. I'm afraid it'll. Bowsfit's looking a bit bare. And then we're taking the old pulpit away and we're going to get a new one made and weld it on. Here's the shiny new pulpit along with the crew for the leg from Bermuda to Long Island. Mike on the left there, Gary Center and me on the right. All ready to go. I'm cooking the last supper for the cruise. This is always a favorite with the crew, macaroni cheese. Looks familiar. Mm. Here's a piece of spam. Now, rolls ya. We are entering the Patchogue River. seen a negative number on the depth kind of before. With the big shed at Weeks's yard in sight, the cruise is over. We've done 19,830 miles since we left. Lou and I have just finished editing the video that you've been watching. Normally at the end of my trip videos, we put on a few shots of the welcome home party. But this time I want to make a few comments of a more serious nature. I've been ocean cruising for more than 40 years and in that time I've seen enormous changes in many of the countries I visit from time to time. Particularly uh, the use of fossil fuel, the development of cars and condos with a garage attached. Uh, typical is Brazil which has gone from an oligarchy to a middle class based economy. However in Brazil at least They've anticipated the fuel problem by developing methods of making fuel from sugarcane. One frequently hears a lot about global warming these days. And of course, one of the objectives of my trip to the Antarctic was to see if it seemed any warmer. 
Now, of course, one can't draw scientific conclusions from only two trips, but my impression was that it, it did seem to be a little warmer. However, I think we must regard global warming as a symptom of a more serious disease. The disease is our obsession with fossil fuel. It's not too popular to discuss with John Q. Public the fact that dramatic changes are in the future, that if he throws the switch, the lights may not come on. The Green Ocean Race is an idea of mine to try to bring to a wider audience the fact that the Earth is going to go through dramatic change, but it may not be too bad that there are optimistic signs that the future can be engineered to deal with the dilemma. On the boats, all the energy that the crew needs will be generated by the motion of the boat through the water, by wind, or by sunlight. And we can compare this with the Earth sailing through space in a few decades with fuel very tight and most of our energy coming from alternate sources. I think we should regard oil as an inheritance to the human race. And like any inheritance, once you've spent it, you have to work harder to maintain your quality of life. And that's what we have to do. I think the publicity surrounding the race will be a great opportunity for companies involved in designing sustainable energy options to bring to the world at large the importance of the work and the need for it. But I would prefer to put it more simply. It's a way for yachts to save the world. Thank you.